Um, this is the next in the series of uh, Raleigh Tabletop mm -hmm. RPGs, uh, how to play uh, um, um, presentations. Uh, sorry, about forgot my uh, uh, mind there a little bit, kind of recovering from a cold, so I might sound funny over the uh, uh, mic here. But anyway, um, we're going to, uh, how to play this time, Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space by um, Cubicle 7 Entertainment, which is a uh, publishing house for RPGs out of the UK. Um, Cubicle 7 has uh, done numerous other games, uh, one of which is uh, the Lord of the Rings RPG, and they uh, also work a lot on um, Call of Cthulhu supplements. But anyway, um, they have produced a magnificent RPG in um, Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space. Uh, before we launch into how to exactly play the game, I'm going to give you a little bit of history and uh, tell you what to look for as far as uh, the game and the supplements that come along with the game. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll tell you about is that um, this is not the first Doctor Who game. Um, as a matter of fact, there's been two other Doctor Who games before um, Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space, and that is uh, the Doctor Who role-playing game, or the Doctor Who RPG. If, um, if you're a, a long-time gamer, you probably remember this one the best. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of people slip and call the current edition of the uh, Doctor Who um, um, role-playing game the Doctor Who RPG, but actually the first one was the Doctor Who role-playing game is um, the Doctor Who RPG, and it's the one that basically was published just right after the fourth Doctor's tenure um, in about 1985-86. Um, but anyway, um, the Doctor Who role-playing game was actually um, uh, produced by FASA um, who also at the time produced another RPG um, for Star Trek, Star Trek RPG, which was rather popular at the time. Um, the Doctor Who role-playing game actually shares pretty much the same um, system that the uh, Star Trek system did. It was a um, uh, percentile-based, uh, skills-based system. Um, the second game that um, was produced for um, uh, Doctor Who was a game called Time Lord, and it was a very little known game. And as a matter of fact, um, only collectors probably were, are able to get a hold of this particular copy of the game. Not a lot of them were produced, and they weren't produced in the same um, kind of market as you would find a role playing game of the period. Um, Time Lord was actually included in a series of novels that they were publishing. It was just uh, added bonus to um, what they were publishing at the time. Time Lord's a quirky little game, uh, requires six-sided dice, and um, very strange how it runs, but if you can get past all the quirks, it's not too bad of a, a role-playing game, but not one that you'd probably want to play all the time. It's a little bit more novel than it was anything else. But those are the two games that, that were previously produced um, for Doctor Who. Um, the current RPG, um, Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space, or Dewatis as a lot of people call it, actually has three editions now. Um, the game was first produced when uh, just as um, the 10th Doctor was um, being replaced by the 11th Doctor. Um, David Tennant's uh, game was a, a pretty uh, elaborate setup. Um, it was a box set, um, as a matter of fact. Um, the box set had a, a lot of working parts to it and um, included enough for you to be able to sit down and play. Now, they extended that out um, in the 11th the Doctor's um, um, set of uh, rules. So basically, they relayed it out and uh, kind of jazzed up the layout a bit and made it a bit different. But essentially, both of them are the same game. And then, when uh, the 50th uh, anniversary of Doctor Who rolled around, they produced a book um, which had all the rules. Um, it wasn't a box set, but it was a book that would go with the uh, supplements that were to be produced in the future. Um, of the three, if I recommend any one of these to get, and they are still found in game stores, 
I would actually recommend getting the 50th uh, anniversary book. Um, that contains all the up-to-date information, plus um, they put a lot of neat things in there, like scenario seeds for each one of the doctors up to um, um, Matt Smith, the 11th doctor. Um, it's a wonderful book. Um, the only thing I would warn you about as far as the Cubicle 7 material is it's a little bit pricey, but um, it's well worth it. It's very, all of these uh, um, games are very beautifully reproduced and uh, very well written. Um, Cubicle 7 has done a stand-up job with these. Now, if you've got the game but you're looking for extra stuff, um, the game also comes with plenty of supplements. Um, the first supplement you, you see up here is the Aliens and Creature supplement, which actually went with the uh, David Tennant edition of the game. And actually, that was another box set. So you have the game as a box set, and you have the Monsters and Creatures as a box set. And it came with a lot of bells and whistles, too, including monster cards, um, extra story points, and uh, a lot of other things that are pretty neat. Um, the Defending the Earth supplement was produced next, and basically that's the supplement for unit. And uh, that was probably the um, last um, supplement that was produced along with the uh, David Tennant edition of the book, or the Tenth Doctor edition of the book. And that has all the uh, information that you would need to know about playing a game based with a unit or having unit characters in your Doctor Who game. The next game, that, or next supplement that came out was the um, um, Companions uh, supplement, the Time Traveler's Companion. And the Time Traveler's Companion actually went out with the Matt Smith edition of the uh, rules in the game. And it also includes a lot of information that was previously published, plus a little bit more on basically how to build a TARDIS and uh, do a, a lot of things to customize uh, a game for yourself if you want to play not only the Doctor but maybe you know your own creation, um, Time Lord or whatever you want to do within the game. Um, the Time Traveler's Companion isn't really a necessary book but it is interesting and again the only thing I'll warn you about this particular supplement is it does repeat a lot of information that's been previously published. Um, now, the other books that you'll see, um, starting with the first Doctor, uh, um, are the splat books that Cubicle 7 has been publishing for the um, past couple of years. Um, they've been doing a uh, supplement on each one of the Doctors. Um, they're beautiful books, um, beautifully uh, you know, detailed and everything. And right now they have gotten, they published up supplements up to the ninth doctor. So you got statistics on all the doctors, all the companions, all the villains and creatures that they encountered is, and allies also. Um, if you have a, a liking for a particular doctor, I would suggest getting, you know, that particular supplement. If you're a completionist collector like myself, you can get them all too. Um, Cupel 7 had at one time a pretty interesting program going. You could actually subscribe to these books and um, they would send you um, a book whenever it was published. And like I said, I have up until the Ninth Doctor. I'm thinking that they have the Tenth Doctor supplement in pros progress right now. Um, I don't really, um, I need to kind of figure out a little bit more about that. But I think their intention is, is to get it up to date with the uh, current doctor, which is uh, Peter Capaldi, um, and uh, make sure that the game, the game supplements are updated as doctors and companions change. Um, kind of going back to the game. Okay, if you have the box set, um, it has a lot of stuff that comes along with it. Now, even though I recommend getting the book of the 50th edition anniversary book, um, if you get um, the box sets, either one of them, they have a plethora of, you know, interesting things um, that come along with it. Um, my only complaint is it's a lot of stuff, but 
that's kind of the bonus too. You get a lot of stuff with these book uh, with these box sets. Um, if you have a box set, you'll get a game master's guide, a player's guide, um, a quick start guide too, just to get your players going and get yourself going uh, on the game, and a booklet of scenarios that you can um, you know use and uh, get started that way. In addition to all that, they have um, all the character sheets that you would need if you're going to play canon characters like the um, 10th or 11th Doctor or Donna Nobles or um, Amy Pond, River Song, John Harkness, and all the characters that you love to, um, you would love to play in the game itself. Also, it has uh, item cards like um, the Sonic Screwdriver or anything that was a uh, um, presented in that particular series of um, uh, Doctor Who uh, um, episodes and uh, extra character sheets and um, uh, a bunch of story points that you can punch out and give to your uh, players uh, so they can use during the course of the game. And we'll go over all that stuff once we start talking about the rules. Um, but Again, if you have an opportunity, you know, if you find the game in any any one of the editions, I'd recommend, you know, you know, looking into it seriously and uh, buying the game. Um, the one thing I'll tell you about the 50th edition uh, um, rules is that um, as a limited edition print, so if you find it on any bookstore shelf or your game store shelves, I'd recommend snapping it up. Okay. So that's enough about um, the history and uh, the current RPG and what you get in the box set. Um, we're going to go on to uh, game mechanics. So if you'll give me a second, I'll switch over and uh, make sure uh, we uh, can see uh, what we need to see here as far as um, um, a character sheet. So if you can give me a second, I will square this up really quick. Your screen share. All right, here we go again. All right, this is a particular um, this this particular um, character sheet is taken from the Eleventh Doctor's uh, game, um, the box set. Um, I'm showing it here because it's very well laid out and uh, not as confused as the Tenth Doctor's one. Um, but anyway. Um, it's a very uh, very easy game to learn and basically um, if you get the box set um, you'll get a bunch of uh, character sheets uh, um, you get the doctor of course and all the canon characters you even get Craig Owens too if you remember Craig Owens and Stormageddon his you know loving baby but anyway you also get like uh, stats for a unit soldier a scientist a rock star archaeologist a footballer, politician, and even an alien. But anyway, kind of to start off this, um, before you can learn really how to play the game, you kind of need to know what the basic um, um, things are on your character sheet. Um, this game is driven by attributes and skills. <clears throat> so whenever you have an attribute or a skill, you'll see numbers upon, you know, numbers in the boxes that we'll, I'll show you. And I'll pull up the um, um, rock star here. Um, essentially, these numbers, you know, will represent a kind of a modifier, so to speak. So this game is actually doesn't require any fancy dice. All it requires is two six-sided dice in order to play. Um, so whenever... Um, whenever you make a roll, you're going to add your attribute and your skill together, plus any anything off of a trait, and you'll roll it against, a, you know, a challenge level that the uh, game master sets. But anyway, kind of going back to attributes. Now, you get the regular attributes that you find in a lot of other games. Um, it's just that these attributes have been renamed a little bit in order to fit the theme of the game a little bit better. So with attributes, that's basically what you physically are. You know, that that's essentially, you know, you as a person. So your attributes are awareness, coordination, ingenuity, presence, resolve, and strength. 
Now, these are just a little bit different than you'd find in any other like Dungeons and Dragons type role-playing game, but a lot of the similarities are there. Take for example, awareness. Awareness is basically how aware you are of your surroundings. Um, in this game, human normal would be about a three. Now, we're looking at the rock star, and essentially, he's a pretty aware guy. He's a little bit above a human average. Now, whenever we're talking about averages and everything, um, we're looking at, you know, again, three being average. So if you go back from that, all characters have to have at least a one in their attributes to be a functional and playable um, character. Um, also, too, you can go no more, no more than six, and that means you're the top of you know whatever you are in that category. So if you have a six awareness, you're mighty aware of your surroundings. Uh, coordination um, would be another one that you know could probably. Um, this one can probably uh, transfer to a, another um, um, thing. The, if I can catch my tongue a little bit, um, could probably equate to dexterity in some Dungeons and Dragons type of game. Uh, coordination is essentially how well you you know you know operate with your arms and your legs and how 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 much dexterity you have. Ingenuity yeah. equals your intelligence. Presence is basically kind of like a charisma. Um, essentially, that's how you can affect other people, uh, just being how persuasive or, you know, how intimidating you can be. Resolve is your willpower. So, essentially, um, a lower resolve means, well, you, you're not as strong in willpower as, you know, you want to be. And our rock star guy is not, doesn't have a lot of resolve. He doesn't have a lot of willpower. Um, the last thing is strength, and strength is basically, you know, obviously how strong you are. Now, if you look at our rock star here, of course, like we said before, his awareness is four. His coordination was four, too, so he's pretty well coordinated. He has to be if he's going to play that uh, mean guitar. Um, his ingenuity is three, so he's of average intelligence. He can get around fairly well. Um, his presence is five, since he's a rock star. He's used to having, uh, commanding everyone's attention. Um, resolve, of course, again, like we were talking about, is a little bit low at two. And his strength is average at three. Now, and those are attributes. That's who you are as a person. Now, the next thing is skills. Now, skills, you don't necessarily have to have a skill. But skills are extraordinarily handy if you're trying to solve problems that are presented in the game. Now, you don't have to have any um, numbers in any, any one skill, but um, like um, attributes, skills, you know, can only go up to a certain number. And I think six is the, the most you can have if you're a human character. Um, you have um, different kinds of skills, and they're very broad categories. Um, the first, uh, cat, first category is um, athletics. And essentially, that's how much of an athlete you are, how much, how much you can do as far as, you know, physical stuff. Um, convince is a, another one that uh, is how convincing you are. Craft is what you can make. Fighting is basically uh, how well you can fight with your um, fist or with a weapon. Knowledge is how much you know essentially, you know, how much book knowledge. Um, marksman is how well you can shoot maybe a, a gun or a bow. Medicine is how much you know about medicine or first aid. Science is, you know, maybe computers or something, if, you know, with, within a kind of a science realm. Um, subterfuge is how sneaky you are. Survival is how well you can survive maybe out in the wilderness or in any kind of survival um, situation. Technology is um, basically being able to fiddle around with things that have, you know, work and working parts. And that could go with computers. You can probably take apart a computer or fix a car, you know, do something technology oriented. And transport is how well you could either drive a car or ride a horse or any kind of other transport that is presented in the game. 
Not only do you get attributes and skills, <clears throat> you get something called traits. Now traits are kind of um, little extra things that kind of define your character, but kind of give you some pluses, possible pluses whenever you're making certain, you know, certain um, challenge roles. Um, traits um, can include, you know, like a far rock star guy here. Um, he can be attractive, charming, lucky, and have quick reflexes, which all modify something. Um, but with traits, you have good traits and you have bad traits. The good traits actually add to whatever you're doing. Bad traits um, essentially allow the uh, GM to play off to some of these traits and uh, put you in a situation where you have to kind of use a little bit of skill and, uh, and while to get out of it. Um, also, too, with uh, traits, um, you get certain certain traits. Um, traits kind of come in, like I said, two flavors, good traits and bad traits. And there's a third kind of trait called special traits. Now, special traits are basically um, traits that a normal human wouldn't otherwise have. These traits are probably pretty much um, reserved for um, humans from the 51st century like Jack Harkness or Time Lords or aliens. Um, those kind of traits you won't find in any uh, special way um, or you won't find in any regular human being. They're special. Um, those might include, you know, as a matter of fact, being a Time Lord is a trait. Um, being able to um, uh, feel the turn of the universe is another one. Those are all, you know, unique traits. Um, also, too, um, stuff. As far as stuff is concerned, this game doesn't really go into having a lot of equipment lists and stuff like that. So it's essentially what you have on your person is what you kind of can, you know, consider your stuff. But like I said before, in order to play the game, um, you get um, challenge roles, and that's basically most of the, you know, um, roles that you'll be doing within the game in order to overcome obstacles and challenges that the GM throws in at you. And the game actually goes out of its way to make sure you know the formula in order to make those roles. And that's usually attributes plus skills plus a trait and plus what you roll from uh, 2d6 in order to um, overcome the uh, uh, challenge level. And we'll go over the challenge levels in just a second. Another thing that um, your character also receives in, in addition to attributes and skills is uh, story points. Now story points is kind of an added bonus and kind of an equalizer in this game. Um, this game is essentially a fans game. So you're usually, you have a doctor and two or three companions running around. Now, if you look at the doctor here, you'll notice off of his attributes and skills, they're mighty high. Um, he is an extraordinarily smart guy. He's extraordinarily well coordinated. Um, but he's heads and above, heads above his, um, um, companions. Now we'll look at Amy Pond really quick. Now Amy's pretty much pretty close to an average person. Of course, you know, she's a companion, but she has some traits that probably set her aside, set her apart from any other person. Um, but in order to kind of equalize the two kinds of characters, um, the game has introduced story points. Now whenever you take a special trait, Typically, that comes with a cost of story points. So if you're a doctor kind of character, you're going to have less story points. Um, doctor here has eight story points. The 11th doctor has eight story points. Some doctors are a little bit better off and have about six. But usually, most doctors will have eight story points. Now, if you take Amy Pond, for instance, Amy has the usual um, starting um, batch of 12. Now, um, some characters um, are inexperienced and they get extra story points, um, like Donna Nobles. 
Donna, Donna is very inexperienced. And I think Craig Owens is too. Yeah, Craig here is extraordinarily inexperienced. Um, and they get a little bit of more of a bump in their story points to help them survive any of the challenges that come ahead. So as far as that is concerned, we'll flip these uh, character sheets on the uh, other side and they'll they give you kind of an explanation of you know how to use story points and what you need to do. So we'll flip it over. All right. And again, this is a wonderful game as far as getting having the character, having your players be prepared. So all I have to do is flip over the character sheet and they get the basic rule, which is again attribute plus skill, plus any traits you have, plus your two-sided dice result equals you know the result to be, beat the difficulty of the task. Um, so right below it is levels of success. Now with this game, you just don't beat um, um, beat the challenge level. You have to beat it by a margin of success. And this is the levels of success that you have in order to um, um, do what you need to do. Now, <clears throat> with this game, you know, if you're just successful, it basically tells you, yes, but. So essentially, if you're just successful at doing something, you do it, but there might be a twist that comes along with it. So if you're trying to jump across a chasm or something like that, it could be that you jump across the chasm, but you lose your footing and you're off balance or something not so great happens. And you have to get a result of, um, um, if it's a result of, you know, just as, if I can untwist my tongue again, just on the, um, the um, challenge uh, level, or three points above it, it's considered just a success. Now, if you get four um, points above it, or you know your success is four above, or four to eight, it's good. That means you set out to do exactly what you meant to do, so the result is good. Um, if you get nine or above, you get a fantastic result, which means if you're jumping across that chasm, on a good, you would have jumped across it and been fine. On a fantastic, you would have jumped across that chasm, rolled and done something a little bit more. So you get the success, but you get extra for rolling so so high and having such a high result. Um, on the reverse side, um, failures work pretty much the same way, except they work against you. So if you get one to three points below, it's considered a failure. You know, you don't get, you don't do what happens, but it's not going to be all horrible. So if you're trying to jump across that chasm, um, you fail. But apparently you're able to just hang on, you know, you almost make it. Maybe you're able to hang on by, you know, you know, by your, you know, hands and stuff like that. All right. Another thing is, you know, again, if you get a um, four, or four or eight points below, it's bad result, which means you don't do what you're supposed to do, and you're kind of at the mercy of um, um, the game master. Nine and below, it's a disastrous result, and that's when the fun and hilarity ensues. Um, but those are your levels of success. Um, we'll kind of go over um, what the levels, what your challenge levels are in just a moment. Um, but anyway, kind of moving on a little bit. <clears throat> um, with this game, you also, of course, like we said, use story points. Typically, story points do a lot of stuff in this game. Um, they're most commonly used to kind of bump up a die roll. Um, so if you feel like you need to make a vital die roll, um, you can trade one story point in for two dice. And for every other story point that you add in, you get another extra six-sider along with it. Um, your GM may want to impose a limit just to make sure that you're not throwing, you know, 10 or 12 dice all at one time. 
but um, but essentially, you know, you can you know use story points like that. Now, sometimes um, story points can be used to give you a clue. Um, you know, and that kind of describes it in the, using the story points thing. So, how it describes it here is, you know, how I sometimes have really brilliant idea. So basically, it gives you a clue on uh, what you do if you're kind of stuck in the game. Um, of course, we talked about extra dice. Um, also, too, you can um, bump up your level of success. Now, um, in some games, essentially, um, I think in the first edition game, you could bump up your uh, success self from a failure to a success, but you couldn't succeed exceed a success. And I think of this game or if the other editions, I think it's the same way. You can't you, you can bump up your uh, levels of failure, but um, you can't go past a success. Um, The next thing is, is that um, you can restore some of your hit points um, and we'll discuss how to lose those and how that works. Um, you can um, be instructed on how to operate something from the doctor. Um, also too, you can either build a gadget or find a gadget. So story points add a lot of things to this. It can even go as high as um, making minor changes to the plot. So um, if you need a, a miracle or something like that, a minor miracle, you can throw five story points or more at your GM and say, hey, I want to do this. Um, so there's a lot of things to do with story points, and they're an important part of the game. Now, you can spend story points, or you can gain story points, too. Um, a lot of times, um, characters will be loaded with some bad traits. Anytime you act on a bad trait, sometimes um, you're, you're qualified to receive a story point for that. Um, a lot of that's up to your GM also. Um, also, too, um, if you um, surrender to your enemy and add to the story in that bit, or, you know, or um, concede to a failure, essentially you'll get story points for that. So that's how you um, get back story points. Um, that's important if you're playing a doctor and companions kind of game where your companions will use up story points really quick or your doctor needs to gain up story points in order to do more and more things later on in the game. So um, we'll move from your story points. So, Basically, you got, you know, a good working idea of the nuts and bolts of the game um, to um, start starting to play the game a little bit. Now, this game is like any other role-playing game. You have, you know, your encounters that you go through. You have your challenges that you have to go through in order to um, beat the game, you know, beat your challenges. And also, too, um, although they kind of talk you down from it, there are some, um, you know, conflict, uh, rules for conflict. Now, when I say conflict, it's not necessarily combat, but anything that your characters might come in conflict with. It could be a chase scene, or it could be a, uh, um, a scene where, you know, you need to talk to somebody, kind of a social combat scene. Um, in this game, particularly, Doctor Who kind of downplays any kind of combat or anything like that. So if you look at this extended action summary, it'll tell you exactly uh, what happens in your kind of your in your initiative order, what happens in uh, an action scene. And essentially you're gonna, you know, the GM will establish the scene. Then the next step would be what's everyone going to do. So everyone has to declare exactly what they're going to do within the scene. And that includes the GMs and PCs. So essentially, most games will say, okay, this is where you kind of roll for initiative. In this game, you don't really roll for initiative. So every, once everyone establishes their intent, you figure out, okay, who are the talkers? And they're the ones that go first. This is a Doctor Who game. And talking is an integral part of uh, 
uh, solving uh, a lot of the uh, conflicts in the uh, series and the same with the game. So anyone who has decided to uh, announce their intent as talking, they get to go first and they get to resolve their uh, conflict by means of communicating to the enemy or to whoever they need to talk to. Um, number B is kind of one of my favorites, runners. Um, I've never seen a game that actually had running as kind of a, an action, but uh, it does um, lend itself to running. And if you watch enough Doctor Who, you know everyone in Doctor Who has to be in darn good shape because they do a lot of running. And as a matter of fact, one of the traits that you'll find in the game is run for your life, which is basically a buff on a, it's a trait that uh, is a buff on a, any kind of chase scene that you may find yourself in. Um, the next one is are the doers. So anything that you're doing that's not of a fighting nature, you're in the doers category. So non-combat actions. So if you're fixing something or if you need to operate a machine or something like that, that's what you do it. That's when you do it. Then the last thing is any fighting is done very last. And again, this particular game kind of de-emphasizes combat. And if you read the rules, they have a, a section or two about guns are bad. And uh, within Doctor Who, that's very much a truism. Uh, you, you find a lot of guns, but they're usually pointed at the doctor or at the doctor and his companions. But the doctor hardly ever uses them. He uses his brains to get out of a situation. And again, like, a, like number step number four says, do it all again. So you just simply repeat it until everything is resolved and the scene ends. Let me uh, open up the uh, rule book really fast and I'll kind of um, guide you through what the uh, levels of uh, challenge are. Um, let me kind of uh, make a real quick uh, uh, switch here. Um, if you can hold on just a second. And I will open up um, the uh, my PDF version of the um, Doctor Who uh, um, 50th edition or 50th anniversary rules. So let me kind of get that set up really quick. And I'll kind of um, get us to a good place here to where we can... Uh, Um, discuss a little bit of, you know, how some of the um, challenges work here. All right, here we go. And um, I'll switch a little bit here. So if you give me just an extra second, I'll switch it from screen share here I can really quick and uh, see if this will come up here we go and we'll start the screen share again hooray all right we got a uh, um, we're on a uh, page 75 of the uh, 50th edition uh, book and here are the task levels that um, you'll see and what the uh, GM will read out to you. So whenever you're challenged with something, basically the GM will work in the description of the challenge, whether this is going to be easy, normal, difficult, or very difficult. So you can kind of figure um, if you're going to have to roll for a particular challenge or task difficulty that um, if I say it's very difficult, you know that you have to have a you know combined total of uh, 24 uh, points of your die roll and your attribute and skills and maybe your traits in order to overcome the uh, um, the task. Now, the higher it is, the less chance you'll probably get of having a fantastic result. So, you'll probably be very happy if you get very difficult of getting even a success with that. But this kind of gives you an idea of 
on this chart gives you an idea of you know what you probably need to do in order to um, basically be successful. Now the tasks that you see here go from really really easy to nearly impossible and typically they put really really easy in there I think as a kind of a joke you know this is basically you know an automatic success. Now nearly impossible is something that you're probably going to you know have you know something that the doctor can do on a very good role. So everything in between you know companions may be able to do it they may not be able to do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, kind of a couple of things to, um, to kind of um, be clear about in this uh, particular game, um, and that is um, whenever you're playing it, um, this game has some little quirks and tweaks to it. Um, if you're a GM, um, invariably you're going to have a player ask you whether or not they can play an alien. Um, one thing that you need to be very aware of is, is that in the rules, they give you the option, but they spend a lot of time saying, don't do it. <laughs> And um, I really back up that, you know, that assessment pretty good. Um, it's nice for characters to have unique characters or, you know, have unique uh, characters that can play. But a lot of times, too, this game, if you're not careful, can get out of hand really fast. Um, it's very well balanced if you have a doctor and a couple of companions. But if you kind of um, throw in an alien or another canon character that's regarded as fairly powerful, like maybe a Captain Jack Harkness or a River Song, the game is becomes unbalanced very quickly, and it becomes very hard to um, 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 handle. So be very aware of that. So if you're a GM and you're looking to engage your characters, you know, just simply, you know, ask them to you know express that through a companion or you know if you're allowing a doctor the doctor another thing to be aware about this game too is it's very much a fan's game so there's some things that if you're a regular rpg player um, you'll find that are kind of not really well covered in this game one is uh, character progression <clears throat> Character progression is um, kind of off the cuff a little bit. Um, there are no mechanics for your character to get better in skills or attributes. That's all done um, via uh, a discussion between the game master and the players. Um, you don't, you know, you don't do so many things in order to rise above, um, you know, to get an extra, you know, bump on your skills or attributes. You don't get experience points or anything like that. It may be that if you used um, a certain skill like maybe marksmanship um, a few times, you might be able to negotiate a bump up in the uh, maybe the next set of games or something like that. Uh, so character progression in this game is kind of slow. Another thing, like I said before, combat. Combat, they kind of look down on this game. They want players to be able to um, uh, figure things out with their, you know, you know, with their cleverness and, you know, thinking through stuff. But in, the, in a way, though, the game's a little bit of a contradiction. You know, they have uh, alien creatures who definitely want to um, hurt, maim, or kill the doctor, uh, like the Daleks, of course and they're loaded up with weapons and stuff like that. Now, as far as this game is concerned, and I'm going to shift back to the character sheet really quick. Um, combat is pretty simple. Um, essentially, with the combat in the game, screen share to go again, and we'll flip it back up to the doctor. 
Um, basically, combat is rolled like any skill attribute and skill role. Um, anything that uh, that you do that is a success, you'll set kind of a you know a basic. Um, if I can think correctly, um, you know, either a doctor might be trying to dodge or something. You'll set a basic challenge level somehow. If the doctor's trying to dodge, the doctor might be able to have a coordination and um, athletics role. That role will become the uh, challenge level that your marksman or your fighter would have to get in order to do some damage to the doctor. Now, damage is done by essentially um, three grades, and it goes along the way, along the same lines as a success, um, you know, a success or good or a fantastic result. Um, a success would be your lowest result. A good is a normal result, and, you know, a fantastic is the best result. So if you had um, a weapon and it had, you know, um, slashes to it. Let me see here if I can find something. Maybe the unit soldier has a weapon that kind of um, gives you the damage. Now, right here, it'll say damage of five. So, essentially, if you go back to the back cover, it'll tell you what the damage should be. So, if you got a five, okay, that would be your good result. Now, a success would be half of that. So that's probably half of that rounded down. So it would be a two, a five, and probably a seven as far as a fantastic result. And typically in the older editions, it would have been expressed on the character sheet as a two slash five slash seven. Um, so whenever someone is successful at combat, and we'll go back to the doctor again really quick. Um, essentially, the GM and the player will kind of uh, negotiate on what um, attribute gets um, knocked down. So if we say a unit soldier or a Dalek was firing at the doctor and scored five points of damage, um, essentially, you know, the GM would have to decide on, you know, which of one of the doctor's attributes would uh, come off, what would make sense. So if he's getting fired at, anything that's physical would probably be taking the hit. So he probably might get a, uh, a point or two taken off of strength, maybe a couple of points off of coordination. Um, you may want to take a point off ingenuity, kind of you know, resulting in kind of some sort of stunned you know, result or awareness is not as much. So that's how damage is resolved in um, 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 Doctor Who. Now, if you're reduced down to zero on any one of these things, um, you become, you know, incapacitated. So, damage takes a while, especially if you're, you know, someone like the doctor. And, um, but whenever you're brought down to zero, you know, you're, you know, pretty much out of the, uh, not out of the game per se, but probably out, of, out for that scene at least. Um, there are probably, uh, well, you'll find rules, you know, for healing and stuff like that. That's basically the nuts and bolts of the system. Um, there's a little bit more to it, but you'll have to read through the rules. Uh, we could probably go all night and discuss the game and everything like that. Um, there are some uh, neat resources that um, you can, uh, you know, rely on, too, if you want to, you know, play the game. And like I said, this is very much a fan's game, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, pretty much um, if you're going to, you know, play the game, it's probably best that you play it with people who know a bit about Doctor Who and can kind of get into the characters. A couple of pointers would be if you're doing a Doctor and Companions game, make sure that whoever's taking the Doctor is probably the most extroverted player in the group. Um, the doctor in many of these games is kind of the driver of the um, uh, session. So whoever is out there and whoever can feel like they can play the doctor should be able to play the doctor. Um, if you have a quieter player, you probably want that quieter player to play 
a companion. Um, but uh, with this particular game, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a good things going for it and everything like that. The last thing I'll show you is um, resources. Now, this game actually has a good fan base. And let me see here if I can uh, get back to the PowerPoint presentation really quick. Um, other game resources. <clears throat> there are two fantastic resources out there for this particular game. Diary, um, the first one is a Diary of Doctor Who role-playing games fanzine. Now this particular um, um, fanzine um, is an online deal. Um, you can find it off of uh, Facebook and all you need to do is just simply plug in Diary of Doctor Who role-playing games. Hold on just a second. <coughs> I am very sorry about that. Um, it has uh, fanzines um, um, from 1 to 21. And not only does it cover um, Doctor Who uh, adventures in time and space, it also um, covers the earlier renditions of um, uh, Doctor Who role-playing games, mainly the uh, initial uh, Doctor Who RPG. Um, but it has scenarios, has a lot of great resources, a lot of great write-ups. So if you decide to get um, uh, Dewatis or, you know, uh, Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space, um, this is definitely somewhere you need to go. And like I said, um, the PDFs are for free and um, available on, on Facebook. And they give you links on where to download all this stuff. The second resource, and which is probably the most fantastic resource in the world for this game, is the Dewatis message boards. And these message boards are fantastic. Um, they basically follow the game, you know, you know, through all of its editions. Um, basically, it gives you tips, tips, write-ups on different characters. Um, People have built characters and put the statistics on the uh, their stats on the uh, message boards. Um, a lot of these um, people who are on these message boards have actually um, read the novels and uh, listened to the uh, radio plays that uh, uh, introduce uh, different characters. Now, now the supplements you, you'll see, and that's another thing that I'll, I'll kind of uh, point out is. Um, all the supplements and all the games only cover what's in the TV series, and that's it. Um, they don't go into any of the novels or any of the radio plays, um, which has kind of gotten sticky with some of the doctors, like the Eighth Doctor, um, who only had the TV movie um, for as 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 far as information and stuff like that, but. Um, if you're in the know about Doctor Who, the Eighth Doctor has plenty of information on the radio plays and in novels, too, that aren't found in the movie whatsoever. Um, but unfortunately, that information isn't included in the uh, supplements simply because of uh, BBC licensing and licensing with the uh, people who publish the books or the radio or produce the radio plays. Uh, so the message boards are a great place to maybe find some stats on. Um, if you take the Eighth Doctor, um, Lucy Miller, who was one of the companions that you won't find in the supplements, but you know was one of the Doctor's companions in the radio plays, and you'll find statistics on um, those kind of characters. But the Dewatis message boards are fantastic as far as information that you can go to, and and maybe hints and uh, tips too. On how to play the game better, um, and um, you can get other things there too. Um, character sheets. Um, I found, um, as a matter of fact, I found uh, character sheets from the first Doctor to, at the time, the eleventh Doctor when that the edition of the game hadn't come out yet. So you'll find a lot of interesting things on the message boards. But anyway. Um, hopefully I've covered everything. I've probably just glazed over it. 
And if you're considering on buying it, I would, like I said, I would definitely, um, if you see any of the games on the shelves, um, you know, I would definitely uh, think about buying it. And if you do find the 50th uh, um, anniversary book, um, if you have a choice between, you know, the box set and the, you know, book itself, you know, I would advise getting the book. Um, it's a very good book. It's a, you know, keeps all of your rules under um, two covers and uh, everything like that. But um, again, you know, Doctor Who, uh, you know, Adventures in Time and Space is a wonderful game. I recommend it to everybody. And uh, if you decide to pick it up, have fun with it. And, um, and again, you know, um, you know, have a great time. And thank you very much.